So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Park. Uh, Dr. Julie Park is an assistant research professor in the bioengineering department at Rice, uh, where she did her postdoc and her PhD. And so she's an expert in cutting edge uh, innovative approaches for genome engineering, specifically CRISPR and genome uh, therapy, and has experience working on a wide range of diseases, including sickle cell disease as well as diabetes. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, we're almost set up and we can get started. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Vicky, for the kind introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Julie. So I work in Dr. Gang Bao's lab here at Wright Bioengineering Department. So our lab is right upstairs in this building. So today I'm going to talk about how we are editing the human genome to correct the disease-causing disease mutations. So, so and then I hope to describe the challenges that we are facing in taking, bringing the safe gene editing therapy to clinic. Yeah, so my work focused on developing CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing therapy for treating sickle cell disease. So CRISPR based gene editing is rapidly entering clinical trial, but then the consequences of gene editing outcome is not as precise as we once thought. So it's generating a high level of unintended large gene modifications at both on-target and off-target cut site in patient engineered patient cells. So here we use the long read sequencing yeah, to highlight the importance of comprehensive analysis of gene editing outcomes for safe clinical translation. Let's go out. So yeah, let me first introduce the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tool we are using for genome engineering. So CRISPR-Cas9 is derived from antiviral system in bacteria. So it has two main components, so guide RNA and a Cas9 protein. So they form ribonucleoprotein complex called RNP. So guide RNA has 20 nucleotides, the protospacer sequence that's used for targeting the specific sequences in the genome. And the Cas9 protein has, is the nuclease protein that's guided by guide RNA to find the target sequence in the genome and generate targeted double strand breaks. So once we generate double strand break in DNA, so the mammalian cells have endogenous repair pathway to repair DNA double strand break. So when double strand break is repaired by non-homologous and joining pathway, also called NHJ, so it rejoins the broken end of DNA fragments and introducing small insertion and deletion at the cut site called indels. And we could supply the homology donor template to promote homology directed repair pathway called HDR, and we can harness the HDR pathway to introduce the gene correction or integrate the therapeutic gene. So the sickle cell disease is a good candidate for gene editing based therapy because it's a monogenic disorder caused by A to T single base mutation in the beta globin gene HBB. So it occurs when a person inherits two mutant copy of beta globin gene from parents so when there's the A to T base change mutation, it changed the amino acid from hydrophilic glutamic acid to hydrophobic valine, and the resulting sickle hemoglobin proteins, they polymerize under hypoxic condition, and the sickle-shaped red blood cell, they lead to capillary clogging, anemia, and organ failure. So in terms of global burden of disease, there are roughly 6 million people living with sickle cell disease, and there's 300,000 babies born every year with sickle cell disease. So currently, bone marrow based, bone marrow transplantation is the only cure, but it's only available for less than 15% of patients who has a matching donor. So there's no cure for the majority of patients. So gene editing based therapy for sickle cell disease is based on engineering patients hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells called HSPCs in ex vivo cell culture or autologous transplantation. So there are two main gene editing strategies for sickle cell disease. 
So first is directly correcting the sickle mutation on HPV that's causing the disease. So this is done by delivering RMP targeting the HPV along with the homology repair donor for sickle mutation correction. So the other strategy is the disruption of BCL11A enhancer, which is to induce the fetal hemoglobin. So BCL11A is transcriptional repressor of fetal hemoglobin, and by inducing fetal hemoglobin, we can ameliorate the sickling caused by sickle hemoglobin. So currently, there are three CRISPR-based gene editing therapies which enter the clinical trial, and two of them is based on correcting sickle mutation, and one is based on fetal hemoglobin induction. So my work focuses on HPV gene editing for correcting the sickle mutation. So in our prior work, we optimized the CRISPR guide RNAs to generate double strand break near the sickle mutation site. And then we also optimized the single-stranded DNA donor template design so we can introduce the sickle mutation at high frequency. And we isolated the HSTC from patient blood and we performed the ex vivo genome editing by delivering RMPN donor using electroporation. And we showed that we can achieve high rate of sickle mutation correction rate of 37% which is above the predicted threshold of 20% for, to achieve clinical benefit. And we differentiated gene-edited HSPC into red blood cells in vitro culture, and we showed that we can rescue pathological phenotype, which is shown by reduction of sickle hemoglobin and the production of normal hemoglobin from gene correction, and this lead to reduced sickling in culture. And we used the humanized mouse model to show that gene-corrected HSTCs have long-term repopulating potential. So we engrafted the human-edited HSTCs into the immune-compromised animal model. And after 16 weeks of long-term engraftment, we isolated the human HSTCs and analyzed the gene editing level and showed the gene-corrected HSC persists in vivo. So the major safety concern of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing is off-target activity because the CRISPR-Cas9 specificity is based on 20 nucleotide guide RNA and target DNA complementarity. So Cas9 could generate off-target double strand break at the off-target sites sharing the sequence homology with the on-target site. So, and when we introduce multiple double strand break on target or off target sites inside the cell, it could lead to gross chromosomal rearrangement, such as translocations. So, there are computational and experimental tools to analyze off target activity. So, the COSMID is an example of in silico prediction tool that search the genome sequences for off-target sites which shares the sequence homology with on-target sites. And the GAI-SIG and CAT-SIG, they are the examples of cell-based assay, which both of them utilize the linker ligation-based PCR and NGS to identify the genome-wide off-target activity. And there have been a lot of effort on engineering the high fidelity version of Cas9 variant which has the enhanced specificity compared to wild type Cas9. So for our gene editing approach targeting HPV, we performed the genome-wide unbiased off-target analysis. We also showed that we can reduce the off-target effect using the high fi variants of Cas9 protein. So the current gold standard method for gene editing quantification is targeted amplicon sequencing of short-range short PCR amplicon by NGS. So it's, it could provide accurate quantification of small insertion or deletion of 50 base pair in length. And the CRISPR introduced double strand break lead to diverse small indel profile. And these indel profiles are known to be influenced by the guide RNA sequence and local DNA sequences 
and also the chromatin features surrounding the cut site. So since 2018, there have been several papers reported the occurrences of large deletions and complex rearrangement at the CRISPR targeted double strand break. And these complex rearrangement include insertion of exogenous or endogenous DNA fragment at the double strand break or inversion duplication around the cut site. So, however, these large deletion and complex rearrangement haven't been investigated for the gene editing in clinical trial. So this is because our limited understanding of the gene editing, these diverse gene editing outcomes, as well as the limitation of technologies available for accurate quantification of these large events. Yeah, so as we discussed, these small indels of less than 50 base pair could be detected easily by short read NGS, but the large deletion could, be, could, could not be detected by short read NGS because the, we lose the primer binding site. And also the large insertions are missed by short read NGS because the larger amplicons are beyond the read length of NGS. Yeah, short read NGS. So here we use the, so in order to capture these large modifications occurring at the CRISPR edited site, we use the long range PCR of five kilobases around the CRISPR targeted site. So we label the DNA template with unique molecular identifiers, UMI, so we can computationally mitigate PCR bias and smart cell loading bias. So we UMI labeled the both ends of target DNA template using tailed primer and by two cycle PCR amplification. And we also performed the additional PCR amplification to further enrich these dual UMI tag amplicons. And we sequence our library on tech bio single molecule real time sequencing like SmartSeq to generate hi fi long reads. So, yeah, we adapted a long UMI pipeline to generate UMI consensus sequences, and we developed a variant calling pipeline so we, we can analyze the gene editing outcomes. We first align the UMI consensus sequences to reference and frequency sequence from the untreated patient sample. And then we categorize the gene editing outcome into four categories. So first is unmodified and small indel smaller than 50 base pair. And second is intermediate deletion of size between 50 and 100 base pair. And third is large deletion, larger than 200 base pair. And lastly, large deletions, larger than 50 base pair. So for the large insertions, we map the inserted sequences to human genomes so we can identify insertion donated sites. Yeah. So we use the smart sequencing with UMI to analyze the edited patient cell at HBB. So we quantified 35% large deletion, 5.5% intermediate deletion, and 1.9% large insertion. So these over 40% combined percentage of large modifications were previously missed by short read NGS. Yeah. So the graph on the right shows the large deletion profile around the CRISPR targeted site. So we can see the large deletions occur around the cut site with different sizes and location with respect to cut site. And we also observe the very asymmetric large deletion profile. And some of these large deletions, you can see the remove the entire HBB gene we wanted to correct, and also the surrounding sequences around the HBB gene. So we also showed that large deletion have a very diverse spectrum. So for this particular sample, we analyzed 1,200 large deletion sequences, and we found 381 unique large deletion patterns. And most of the large deletions start from the CRISPR cut site, but we also found some alleles has large deletion that's happening away from cut site, 
and some alleles have multiple large deletion in one week. So for the large insertion, we identified large deletion insertion sizes ranging from 50 base pair up to one kilo base pair. And most of the inserted sequences map around the CRISPR cuspide near the HBB, showing the complex local rearrangement and rest of sequences map to the other chromosome in human genome. So, but we could not find the like, apparent sequence homology between HBB and inserted sequences. So we suspect that the insertion may be due to the proximity of the insertion donating site and HBB at the time of double strand repair in terms of the 3D genome context but it's like difficult to validate our hypothesis due to very diverse diversity of insertion and very low frequency. So on the left is a list of four therapeutic guide RNAs developed for sickle cell disease gene editing. And we analyzed comprehensive editing by SmartSeq with UMI. And for all guide RNAs at three different loci, we showed the large deletions and insertion occur at high frequency. And these large modifications persist after two weeks of in vitro erythroid differentiation. And we also showed that these large deletion and insertion also happen at off-target mediated double strand break. So we wanted to develop an assay that could be easily adapted and utilized by gene editing lab. But the major limitation of the SmartSeq method is the availability and accessibility of PEC bio sequencer, because the most of genome editing lab have access, easy, easy access to Illumina short tree sequencer, but then usually the PEC bio sequencer are available at the sequencing core. So we, here we developed the long m which is based on long-range PCR, followed by the fragmentation and adapter ligation and NGS library prep and sequence on the my -seq. So, and we also developed bioinformatics pipeline so we can filter out and analyze the short tweet spanning the CRISPR edited cut site. So the long m assay enabled in-house and high throughput analysis for gene editing outcome, including large deletions. So here we analyzed the same gene edited sample by both SmartSeq and long m and showed the overlapping small indel profile. So next we analyzed the large deletion by long m So and the same sample analyzed, analyzed by SmartSeq and LongMSeq, they identified the same deletion pattern with over 90% overlap. And we also show the total rate of large deletion measured by both assays shows a high correlation. So next we investigated the persistence of large deletions using a humanized mouse model. So again, we engrafted gene edited patient HSPC into immune deficient mice, and we compared large deletion rates in pre-engraftment sample and post-engraftment sample. And we showed that large deletion rate and diversity remained high after engraftment. So this shows that large deletion occur in long-term and repopulating hematopoietic stem cell, and these cells persist in vivo. So what are the consequences of these large deletion and insertion in hematopoietic stem cell for gene editing therapy? So these large deletion could lead to permanent deletion of target gene and also nearby genes and insertion of exogenous or endogenous DNA fragment into CRISPR double strand break could lead to expression of aberrant RNA or protein and could alter cellular function and impair stem cell potential. So in clinical application of gene editing, we need to infuse over 10 million gene edited cells per kilogram weight of patient. So even very low frequency of affected hematopoietic stem cells could lead to clonal hematopoiesis and potentially cancer. 
So in conclusion, so our work showed that CRISPR-Cas9 double strand break lead to unintended large mutations that both on target and off target sites. And then we showed the persistence of these large mutation as in the long term repopulating stem cell, but for now we don't know the long term phenotypic consequences of these large mutations. And the gene editing outcomes are very diverse, and this limits the accurate assessment of comprehensive gene editing outcomes. And the clinical gene editing requires better quality control so we can address these safety concerns. So we are currently working on answering this question for safe clinical translation. So what are the biological consequences of this large deletion and insertion? Is there any detrimental consequences? And what is the mechanism of DNA double strand break repair that lead to high frequency and diverse large deletion repair? And we are also working on improving the gene editing strategy so we can potentially reduce and eliminate these large mutations. Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gang Bao for his mentorship and then the Bao Lab members, especially Ming Ming Kao, a fourth, third year PhD student who brought bioinformatics expertise for this project, and also our co-authors, Dr. Todd and Ile from the Rice Computer Science Department for their valuable advice on wrong read analysis. And I'd like to thank Dr. Vivian Shihan, Siam Emory University. She's a long-term clinical collaborator on sickle cell disease. I also want to acknowledge the sequencing course so at University of Oregon and also the Baylor sequencing core for processing our PEC bio read. Okay, thank you. Cool. So, um well, people are thinking, I actually have a first question. I think it's kind of very impactful work to realize that, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement about gene editing, but like potential concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in, in practice, is it possible to do some kind of QC, filter the cells and then inject the, infuse them or does that mess them up and then you can't infuse them anymore and you just have to make sure you have a completely clean kind of separate sample first? Yes, so, I mean, it's, very, until very recently, we did not even know these large modifications happen in gene edit itself. So before, yeah, the field relied exclusively on short read NGS to quantify the gene editing outcome. And then back then, we thought CRISPR only introduced small indels of 50 base pair. So the problem with yeah, clinical translation is, as I mentioned, like for bone marrow transplantation, we need to infuse like up to like 1 billion cells per patient. And we could only analyze like very small sample, like million to do all these analysis. And then it's especially concerning that we found the CRISPR editing outcome is very diverse. So yeah, we may miss the critical like detrimental mutation that may happen more rare than one in million cells. Yeah, so that's a big concern. I see. Yeah, and so there are no technologies right now where you could actually kind of screen them but still use the same cells downstream. You would have to just make sure it's very clean to start with. Mm -hmm. And also, the, yeah, another issue for doing that is we are doing the stem cell engineering. Uh, so we have very short window of time to do the ex vivo culture, to do editing before we put the patient fell back into the patient, so we don't get to have like multiple rounds of expansion to in, yeah, have more cells, so yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, so, you know. Yeah, so n nice talk. I, I didn't realize, I mean, all this is kind of bad news. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm going to sell all my stock in the CRISPR Cas <laughs> company. So. But the, the serious question is, is to what extent are other people worrying about this? So you see a lot of papers published, mm -hmm. and I just review a grant using this technology. So if people don't try to look for what happened, yes. mm -hmm. will they not find it? Could it be kind of innocuous? Yeah, that's the that's my concern as well. Yeah, so I mentioned like the 
several genetic editing strategies using the guide RNA we analyzed in this work. They already entered clinical trial and patients have already been infused with the stem cell edited using this exact guide RNA and like delivery method. So, but then, so the best case scenario is this large deletion lead to the deletion of gene we try to correct. And the, in the case of the HPB gene, we think the disruption of HPB would give the stem cell the selection pressure against during the differentiation. So the in base, best case scenario, those large deletions knock out HPB and those cells don't make it into the functional red cell in peripheral blood. So that would be like the best case scenario. It just lead to the gene disruption. But then the problem is, yeah, we know CRISPR also introduced off-target mutation. And then our prior risk assessment for off-target analysis is based on the location of off-target double strand break. So if it's at intronic the like intergenic sequence or non-coding sequence, we used to consider it like not pathogenic, but then the presence of this large deletion means it could yeah, extend to nearby gene and disrupt the critical gene involved in cancer, yeah, things like that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, now there are next generation of gene editing technology that can change the desired base mutation without making double strand break, such as base editor and prime editor. So I think field is gonna move into the next generation yeah, base edit, gene editor without making double strand break, because it's very difficult to control how cells repair once we generate double strand break, yeah. I had a question about um, just the design of the unique molecular identifiers. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I had a question about the, uh, the use of the unique molecular identifiers. Um, so you incorporated those uh, mainly to eliminate PCR errors or sequencing errors from, and distinguish them from real biological events that occurred because uh, you're, you don't, um, it, it, was that the purpose of them or could you just explain that part? Yes, so yeah, initially the main purpose of after CRISPR editing, we have very like diverse large deletions. So which means when we do the long range PCR, we have very diverse like amplicon sizes from 1 kb all the way to 5 kb. So we are initially very concerned about potentially enriching the like short amplicon carrying large deletion. Yeah, so that's why we, yeah, implemented the UMI to do the computational yeah, bias mitigation. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a great talk. So uh, my question is really if, if I'm not uh, wrong, what I got from uh, the full uh, talk or the papers. So the deletion or the intersection, we can uh, change in the sequence of the gene, right? Like we can cut, like extract some gene sequence, the errors out. Uh, from a sequence. Okay, could you please repeat the question? Oh. So if I'm not wrong, so uh, by this doing this deletion or uh, intersection, so the gene, genomic sequence, we can change in that, like uh, we can edit the gene, right? Oh, so you're talking about, oh, once we introduce large deletion, can we later fix that? Yeah, like mm -hmm. uh, we, like there is a mutations happening every time with the genes. So is it possible like using this uh, uh, deletion or intersection going back to the previous situation of it or like uh, making artificial mutation and then going back to the uh, situation where from where we started doing this intersection and making a deletion process going back to the previous situation? So yeah, that may be a possibility if we don't have very diverse insertion and deletion. So the problem is the, yeah, it leads to very diverse insertion and deletion. It will be difficult to design like guide RNA or gene editing strategy to fix everything back to before, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, well let's thank uh, Dr. Park again and then I think we're gonna transition into our uh,